Welcome to our seventh webinar in the Rebuild series of webinars, all based on the book, Rebuild the Economy, Leadership and You. And tonight we're going to be talking about the Fair Shares Comms Incorporation and why it really is a powerful foundation to build any regenerative, circular, stakeholder, well-being or whatever economy on. At the heart of everything that Jack and I have in the book is what Otto Lasca has recently described as an ecosystem, a sociology of ecosystems. And everything we're doing is saying one reason why so many of the endeavors so far to build a world that works for all have fallen far short of what we need from them is because they address one or at most two of the layers or ecosystems in our six strata ecosystem sequence. The lowest layer is my internal or each of our internal systems and interactions. Stratum two is our interpersonal systems and interactions. Stratum three is our organizational roles, task systems and interactions. And so for example, the things like the Bar Barrett stuff works mainly at strata two and three, but doesn't touch everything. So it's necessary, but not complete. Stratum four are the systems and interactions around the different capitals and stakeholders. And again, that's where we're seriously broken with the limited company and corporation. Stratum five are local business ecosystems or local economies. And stratum six is the global economy. And the central thesis running through all of Rebuild is that we need a coherent whole approach that spans the first four in order to build something that works at five and six, which is why we say, if we're gonna build, say a circular economy, we have to do strata one, two, and three. And we've covered those in earlier webinars. And this one we're focusing in on stratum four, the Fair Shares Commons Incorporation. So if I um, dive deeper in, let me, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly and then we'll dive into some discussion. Eleanor Ostrom has done some superb work on the commons and three of the things from her work that I want to just highlight here all beneficiaries must also be involved in stewarding and caring for the commons. It must have an inclusive multi-stakeholder governance and it must be protected against predators and parasites. So that's core to what we're doing. Next thing I'm going to touch on now, if you want to build in stratum four, something that is a legally incorporated multi-stakeholder, multi-stake, multi-capital commons to get all of the power that incorporation can give you to enable and protect what needs to be enabled and protected. There are a few things to get clear on. First of all, get clear on which capitals the business touches, which stakeholders represent them and all of the other key stakeholders. That is critical to get to the next stage, which is you need to have a business concept for all capitals, not just for financial capital, which is how most business concepts and business plans are created, but one for each capital. And you can read more about this on page 51, the six capitals 
um, from the Integrated Reporting Initiative. This part is like the normal business concept for a standard business that you're used to, say a lean business model canvas. Only now you're answering these questions for all of the capitals, not just for money. You know, why this business? What are the problems you're solving? What are the solutions you're offering? What is the value proposition? What are the costs and revenues? But all of that now in each capital. Once you've got that, I'm going to jump to that slide first. So once you've got that, you get to the point where you can now look at incorporation. And one of the issues around incorporation is that typically founders, investors, entrepreneurs, lawyers, economists and everybody, they tend to look at incorporation, perhaps somewhat the way that a fish looks at water. It's just a given. It is what it is and we accept it and we, we just work within the incorporation we have. Whereas what we're saying is there's nothing that is a given about incorporation. It's all invented. And the incorporated company the incorporated person was invented as a tool to create trust between stakeholders. If you go back 400 years ago at the point where the first businesses were emerging that required more capital than any one family had its dis disposal, the, incorp the, the corporation was invented as a tool to create trust between people who had money, but did not know each other or trust each other by virtue of being part of the same family. It solved that problem beautifully. And in today's world, we can use exactly the same tool to create trust between strangers, but now across all capitals, between all stakeholders. And that's what the Fair Shares Commons is. It's a tool to create trust across all capitals, between all capitals, between all stakeholders within a stakeholder category and between categories. And what I'd love to do at this point is pause what I'm saying and just open up some space for discussion. You know, and I'll put in you know, two questions, a broad question of, what does that whole proposition of looking at a company as a tool to create trust and all we need to do is broaden it out as a very generic question and then a very specific question for those of you who are into regeneration, circular economies, donut economies, whatever, what kind of trust is really needed for a circular economy to be truly robust or even anti-fragile? And where is, yeah, so those are the two questions I put in. Who would like to say something in re response to what I've been saying up until now? I have a question. What came up for me was, yeah, is there a business model canvas that incorporates all the um, capitals? And I'm not sure Dunya posted one. Um, and maybe can if that does represent the, all the. It uh, definitely does more. It, it does take into consideration more than the usual, just the usual capital. I think there are three. It's not also. It's not based on the rebuild model, but it has like uh, consideration for the environment and for the social dimensions as well. I'm also new to flourishing business model canvas and I'm exploring as part of a exploratory team. Excellent. I'll, I'll point you at that point, certainly at the book. I think it's page 395. We have our fair shares commons canvas. Um, 
and I'm going to put a JPEG right now into the chat window. And then in various places in the book, and of course, in our Fair Shares Commons workshop for people who are building a Fair Shares Commons company, we go into that in more detail. Great, thank you. Tom, may I nudge you? you you've introduced and set yourself up for being nudged that you've been looking <laughs> at commons for a while and looking at leadership commons and things like that you know yeah. what role uh, does trust play there i, I was i was i was trying to be quiet and, and not dominate the conversation but i love i love your concept of trust and i never thought about the that incorporation was meant to instill trust the way you talked about it but it's interesting in america we're known for hamburgers and hot dogs and the way that those became successful was when they were able to uh, make americans trust the ground meat and the and the and the stuff in the hot dog so establishing trust is absolutely essential to any business and what what i'm really curious about and i see that the little bit I've delved into your book is that it's relatively easy for a new startup to start up in this proper way. But when I'm dealing with like my biggest uh, client is Accenture and, you know, 500,000 people operating in the traditional business model yet embrace seriously embracing the UN SDGs and sustainability and the circular economy. In fact, Peter Lacey, who's their head of sustainability, wrote the handbook on the circular economy. How do we work with existing businesses who may have trouble getting, you know, totally changing their, their traditional shareholder model? They're all trying to embrace stakeholder, but I love your point is that if at the end of the day, the only people with a true vote are the shareholders, it's not truly a stakeholder model. So that's the conundrum I'm thinking about because I've got to work with all of those companies and frankly I think if we don't bring the Accentures and the, the the PepsiCo's and the Shell Oils and those guys online quickly um, we're you know it's not going to be good for my grandchildren yes I say if, if you don't mind if I can just jump, jump in briefly uh, and actually, as a professor, what I like to do is I like to nudge people. And I, I go around the room and, and look at people that are just maybe a little bit willing or unwilling. But anyway, let me just mention something brief, briefly about trust. You know, this is something that Eleanor Ostrom wrote a lot about. And I've been rereading a lot of her, her work. And, and there's, there's, there's basically two different levels or two different dimensions. Dimension number one is within the organization. And in order to trust, you don't have to like each other. You could really dislike each other, but you know, there needs to be this sentiment. But then in outside organizations, uh, there needs to be this mutual trust. In other words, the, the organization needs to trust the outside and vice versa. And you know, that's that's something as you mentioned that. It's it's missing. You know, when we go out to the outside world and look at these linkages, what is the way to link up the uh, the rest of the world in this notion of trust? And I do think we have a long way to go. Yes, but I, I just want to mention the double dimension there. I'll I'll pick up on what you've said. Um... And I'll, I'll say a couple of things here. First of all, with large organizations like Accenture, for example, figure 12.2 in the book and the, the chapters, chapters 12 come in with the relationships between the different strata. And in particular, one of the things that we're saying in there is it's really important for leaders of an existing company to be aware of what is well within the support of their existing structures and interactions, what is on the edge of the support, and what is 
leaning so far away from the edges that it is becoming a relatively fragile flying buttress. Um, and in that sense, you know, if I let me take as an example Unilever. Paul Polman with Unilever did a superb job in his almost 10 years at the helm of Unilever. And there was one point towards the end of his time as CEO where he had to quickly shift into reverse gear and go back a few notches because Unilever was under threat of a hostile takeover from Kraft. And this is the kind of constraint that he was under that, you know, to, in my opinion, he would have done far more if he, if there had been a route to reincorporate Unilever as a fair shares commons, because then he would really have had the suppliers, the customers, all of the different stakeholders across all of the capitals that Unilever touches, all of them would have had a counterbalancing input and governance power versus the investors. So I think for existing companies, first of all, it's actually really healthy to be aware of when are you taking a risk by stepping onto seriously thin ice that may not support what you're trying to do beyond what you as a leader can support through your force of personality. Yeah, yeah. and if, if a leader is aware of and saying, right, we're now into territory that is critically dependent on my force of personality, being able to keep the investors on my side, then they're going to engage differently to if they believe that this is unaffected by how they're incorporated. The other thing I'll put in, and this is part of our business plan for what we're doing, you know, we, we already have our startup factory slowly growing and scaling, and we're busy working on building a full investment vehicle behind it. And our approach is to build a holding company that will hold all of the companies that come out of our startup factory, all of them using our substrate or platform. Now, what an existing company could do, many existing companies have a corporate venture capital unit. There's nothing to stop their corporate venture capital unit investing in companies that are fair shares commons incorporated. And my bet is that those companies will outperform other companies long term. And that's one route where existing companies can incrementally shift their operations in a continuous glide path into an appropriate incorporation. Because I, I do tend to agree with you for something like Accenture to convert in one fell swoop to a fair shares commons would perhaps be a little bit like an 18 wheeler standard trim, no extra rocket engines or anything like that attempting to jump the Grand Canyon. You know, it's Tom. Have you, guys, have you guys looked at um, the B corporations and how that compares to um, Fair Share Commons? I haven't had a chance to compare the two yet. Yes, yes. So I started looking at incorporation 10 years ago now. And initially I was very excited about the, the public benefit corporation. And we, we need to distinguish between the B Corp certification and the public benefit corporation as an incorporation, the weakness of the public benefit corporation, you know, and I'll take Delaware as an example. If you actually look at the articles of incorporation, the bylaws in Delaware, you still have all of the power in the hands of the investors of financial capital. And so there's almost nothing in terms of protecting anything other than what the investors of money are interested in. So yes, it's, it's pointing in the right direction, but first of all, from that perspective, I think it's, it still has a number of Achilles heels. And secondly, 
it doesn't do one of the key things that we need to make an economy work for everybody, which is to incorporate on all capitals, make businesses that multiply all capitals, so they're inherently regenerative. And what the Fair Shares Commons gives you is a structural systemic value flow between any two companies that interact with each other. If you've got the latest release of the book, Tom, sections 6.4 and 6.5 talk about ergodicity and non-ergodicity, basically saying that the way that economists and MBA students are taught to calculate expectations has a fundamental flaw that leads us to seriously underestimate benefits, overestimate, sorry, underestimate risk, overestimate benefits, and leads to a misunderstanding of the value of collaboration between companies. And you know, this is basically pure statistics, pure mathematics that supports what a Barrett values assessment will show around the importance of collaborative values. And this simply underpins what you guys have been saying for decades, but now from pure statistics, no values involved. <laughs> and that's what the Fair Shares Commons gives you is a direct exchange of value between companies that are in an ecosystem of companies that are mutually interdependent. Welcome, Valerie. Glad you can join us. We're just having a bit of a discussion at the moment around the thoughts that are triggered around looking at the incorporation as a tool to create trust between strangers, that the company is a tool to enable and protect via structures, processes, and principles. So that's what it's all about. Uh, Graham, I do yeah. think Hilo um, wanted to say something a little earlier. Thank you, Jack. May I jump in? You're welcome. Yeah, yeah please, please do. Of, of course, as always, so many thoughts arise as, as you speak, Graham, and as everyone uh, shares. And so maybe I have a couple of different nuggets, if, if, if you don't mind. <laughs> One is we talked about trust and the importance of trust. And I also had not thought of incorporation as a way to create trust between different parties and definitely appreciate that notion. And I got a curiosity question, but maybe there's a there there. And I have to give context before I ask the question. So when we look at what started happening in the nineties and you know, whatever it's called, hot in the two thousands, you know, the Google, Airbnb, Uber, and such companies that would even, even just looking at information from the internet and trusting that, that would not have been possible if there hadn't been an undercurrent shift, sea change of trust itself, because nobody would have sat in a stranger's car, taken a stranger in their house, or trusted information put together by unknowns and so on, right? And that change, all of these different businesses that arose and there are many others, but many of these businesses became possible because there was fundamentally an underlying sea change of trust itself. And similarly, in the last few years, we've lived through an underlying sea change in distrust, sort of the other side of the same thing. We need to process both. And I'm just curious, the curiosity question here is, I'm wondering if there are some other emergent themes something beyond trust that's pushing what is arising now. Similarly, as trust, you know, even when we didn't know that it was a trust that was changing, you know, we could see that there's Airbnb and Uber and all these other things, right? We may not have immediately connected that there's a change in trust. When you think about it, of course there's a change in trust. It seems obvious, except it wasn't obvious until it became obvious. I'm wondering what might be the types of phenomena that are arising now, sort of in the undercurrent background that could be truly helpful for the conversations like the Fair Shares Commons Incorporation and just this whole multi-stakeholder interconnectedness interbeing exactly 
and, and those types of undercurrents. And that would be an interesting thing to look at both theoretically for the power that that points us towards as well as practically to see where we might be supported by a greater way than what we can orchestrate ourselves. So that was one. The other one was I had a question and that actually, the conversation kind of went there and started answering it. And my question was just, can a large existing company do a fair share of comments? And, and then I said, well, better than can is the question, how? And then you started addressing some of it. I'm not sure I'm sold on the corporate funds just because I work with them and I see how they currently think from the current place of thinking, I'm not sure I can see that happen in principle. Why not? Anything's possible in principle, but I have to walk with that a little bit. The other thing is, you know, there are these very large initiatives or the sort of moonshot type things where they truly change their world just by announcement where a world looks one way on Monday and then different way on Tuesday, you know, I mean, many examples, but in business, it might be a behemoth getting into healthcare now, for example, you know, or, or, or anything like that. And those might be orchestratable in that way, as long as it's not mainly around fair shares common, the main value would be the headline value of what is now being done. And the structure behind that would be the fair shares common type value interchange equal or whatever equivalent value and interchange directly. And then I'm also wondering if there are examples and they don't have to be from the world of business, but can be, but, and they might be more from social life or from nature, but what would be functional if fair shares commons type examples that are not that structural because there are not businesses set up as fair shares commons but that functionally operate that way. And I mean, it seems to me that a lot in nature in many ways operates that way already. In some simpler societies, I'm assuming that there are examples that operate that way that might be something to, to consider. So that's that's where my mind went. Thanks, mm. and thanks, Jack. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, actually, and I'm gonna go good. off camera again, just, just in case it gets mm. wobbly again. You know, actually just to get a, uh, maybe just answer Kilo's uh, last item, uh, and this is something that we, we mentioned a lot in the book, but if you look at the, you know, the, the overall ecosystem of ants, you know, not ants and uncles, but, you know, ants, uh, I think that's a good example. And very critical in there is uh, the notion of boundaries within this ant system. Yes. And... Uh, I was going to say, Ellie Rose, um, as I suspect the youngest person in this call, <laughs> I'd be, if you're willing to speak, I would be very keen to hear your thoughts um, on, in particular, on the first of Kilu's questions around trust, your perception of the behemoths like Uber and Google and so on around trust and what else there might be that we're not quite seeing yet but are trending towards? Yeah, sure. I actually found that really interesting as you were yeah. speaking, Kilo, because I feel like, and perhaps this is a wider conversation about perhaps the last year and the impact of COVID-19 and everything, but particularly in the UK right now, I feel like we're kind of surrounded by a lot of distrust and I don't know, um, it's uncertainty, I guess, more than anything, but like, um, especially in terms of those kind of technology aspects, like a lot of social media now, people aren't trusting what they're reading. People are um, less trusting of the media, of, politics of conversations you're having with friends that you used to align views with um and i'm not entirely sure how this would impact business per se but i know that even in my experience speaking with peers and colleagues um a lot of opinions seem to be split at the moment and i see that a lot with sustainability as well and especially in young people, like obviously there's supposed to be this um, 
generational difference in I see a lot of people talking about like it's the young people who are sort of leading this um, fight against the climate crisis but mm. I also see a lot of people that seem completely unfazed and I think it's the same with COVID-19 I think it brings out more sort of clashes um, that can be barriers to that trust um, and mm. I think they can wriggle their way into things so <laughs> mm. yeah I don't know Yes. I'd like to point at a couple of things. Um, in chapter nine, where we describe the 28 forms of thought that people develop once they've mastered binary logical thinking, the process thought forms, especially process one and two, are around developing the capacity to recognize that whatever is is always moving towards what it isn't. So when we have states of high trust, we need to be aware that that's always going to move towards states of distrust, and that will pendulum back again. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to bring in is I've long talked about Google. Google was a company that initially had as its very core principle do no evil and so so long as google was perceived consistently to be sticking to that principle by everybody it was easy to trust google and what i see more and more especially talking to friends who you know i, I grew up in the open source software world so i still tend to think of google back in the days when it was a very small company. Um, but many of the people that I talk to who have only come into the Google world relatively recently, say in the past 10 years, they do not have a very high trust in Google. Many of them are saying, hang on, you guys are making a fortune out of all of my personal data that I have entrusted you with. If Google was incorporated as a fair shares commons, where all of the people who have a Google account also had governance rights in a Google AGM and were sharing in the wealth generated by Google by their data, that would create the foundation for trusting Google deeply. Similarly with Uber, you, you talk to many of the Uber drivers and there are not many of them who are wholeheartedly positive about the amount of money that Uber is making versus the amount of money that they are making. If it was Fair Shares Commons Incorporated, that would be completely different. Which is why, for example, if we take Airbnb, there's another company out there called Fair b and And they are definitely designed to be fairly incorporated. And are in dialogue with Rory and the rest of us in the Fair Shares Alliance on what else beyond what they currently have, which is already a pretty good incorporation for fairness, what else can they do? Um, I'm aware that we're coming up to the top of the hour and Dunya, you need to leave us fairly soon. Would you like to bring in any points on your side before you need to leave? Thank you, Graham. Um, it's been a pleasure to be present and witnessing and listening, and I hope to be back. Um, as to what was being shared, uh, it's interesting, the notion of trust. And I was thinking of, in my everyday life, because I haven't been part of these large corporations and and i haven't had to think in those contexts in my life i think in a very fractal way and i think of small groups and i think of my of community and so this notion of stranger is not so alive for me uh and and having to build trust there but i know that it's very important as well and so my mind was going into how do those two dance together and how within large organization can there be that fractal nature and those small groups and 
and and the notion of open space technology uh, in the context of like Accenture and those big groups in order to build trust was also something that came up as being very powerful uh, to also uh, break down silos and hierarchy that gets in the way of, of trust being built. Yes. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Dunya. Tom, any words from you before you need to step out? Yeah, I, I, I love this conversation. I hope to be back and I would invite anyone to connect with me on LinkedIn who wants to. But the trust thing is so interesting because if I feel that you and I are one, I feel we're in the same family or we're all part of the humanity and I recognize our interconnectedness, there's really no trust needed because we're, we're both one. We only need trust when we think of ourselves as two, as stranger, as Dino was saying. Yes. Um, and I love the, the national, you, when you're, your question, Kalu, about the interconnectedness in nature and the fact that supposedly all mushrooms and all trees are connected everywhere beneath the ground. I mean, I think a lot of it is uh, helping shift the mindsets for people to have a new definition of their identity and who they are and who they truly are, um, which I think we're all interconnected. And once, once you have that understanding, it changes everything. Yes. One thing I'll put in on what you've said, Tom, just yesterday I was chatting to one of the people on the advisory team, Klaus Michael, and in that conversation, I said, Klaus, let's take that as a metaphor. You know, what we're talking about is the fair shares commons is like the marriage ceremony. You might know each other, but until you actually get married, reincorporated, you're still perfectly free to just walk away from each other. But when you really want to be a family, be one, you go through this marriage ceremony. And that's what incorporation is like. It's a marriage ceremony. Well, I, I do have to leave, but I'll celebrate my 43 years of marriage with my, my spouse uh, on, that, on that note. Thank you all. It was great talking. Excellent. To you. Thanks, Tom. Cheers. Great. Um, I'd like to mention something. Uh, actually, she left us, but you know, I really like the metaphor of dancing together. I, I really like that. And... Oh, maybe that's something that I could work with. And maybe something else I'll just briefly mention, let anybody else uh, pick up on this. But, you know, we're using the word trust, but is that the right word? And, and as Tom mentioned, uh, if I do trust another individual, it's almost like we're at, we're at different levels. You know, I might be at a lower level. This other individual might, you know, be possessing of something that's, that's a barrier. And there, there's this built-in asymmetric relationship. And I'm wondering, really without an answer, if that's the right word. Uh, when I'm thinking of trust in the context of what we're talking about, as well as trust in all the places where attorneys get involved in business that you know I see in my daily life, it's very much from the survival mindset of how is someone going to hurt me? Is someone going to hurt me? How do I protect myself from mm -hmm. getting hurt? I think that's a different trust than some other forms of trust. So we might want to have a whole different vocabulary or stages or, 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 or levels or alphabet to point, you know, trust A versus trust F. But uh, it's, it's absolutely maybe we need the hierarchical. Maybe. I hadn't thought of it until you mentioned it. Maybe we need different variations of the word, different I, definitions. Hmm. I think as well, when you think of trust in that context, it becomes more about vulnerability as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. One of the, um, something that I've worked with and found very useful is exactly what you are pointing at is to look at trust as something that has multiple dimensions. Looking at trust in four dimensions, you know, one of those dimensions is consistency. Do you always do the same thing in the same situation? The second one is coherence. You know, is what you say you're going to do the same as what you actually do? The third one is adaptability. 
do you, can I trust you to do what's right in the moment? And the thing is, for some people, adaptability is the lowest in their sort of um, ranking for trust. For other people, it's the highest. For me, adaptability is the highest. I would far rather that if the context now is best served by you doing this, then I would most like you to do this, even if yesterday you said you would do that. Whereas for other people, that kind of adaptability is actually a signal for somebody not being trustworthy. They don't do exactly what they said they would do. And so, yes, trust is actually a very much a multidimensional thing. And each of us looks at trust, evaluates trust through very different lenses using different frames of reference. And that's also a bit where, why it's, Jack and I saw it as so important to include in the book, everything across all six strata, including the inner individual and the inter-individual. It doesn't help if you have a legal incorporation that is trying to act as a tool to create trust if each person inside themselves is creating completely different meanings and interpretations of trustworthiness based on something that's happening. So we need to simultaneously work with the inner individual, the inter-individual, how work is done and how it's incorporated in a coherent way across all four strata. Good. Noticing the time, I'd like to whip through the remaining slides and just touch on those. And then we can have some final discussion minutes before we hit the formal half past end where some people have also scheduled to leave. And I can certainly stay in after that if there are more questions, discussions that want to happen. So just to dive on. So incorporation is a tool to create trust between strangers. And by between strangers, I really mean people who are not deeply connected with each other in other ways. For example, having been part of the same family. I mentioned you also need to build a fair shares commons, a clear, compelling business concept and a business plan that will actually work across all capitals. This is not something where you just rely on a never ending flow of donations or investments into the company. This has to be a viable business across all of the capitals it touches. Once you've got these, so you've got the Commons Foundation, you've understood which capitals and stakeholders, you know what you need to enable and protect, you know what the business concept is, then you're in a position to define the different stakeholder classes. And each of these stakeholder classes will be represented by a different class of shares with different properties. And a typical minimum are stewards, staff, other investors of non-financial capitals, customers, suppliers, cities, the planet, etc., and financial investors. Something that I will stress in the book and when we're working with people, we will construct an example fair shares commons. But that's really just an artifact to illustrate the underlying essence or underlying form. So the fair shares commons can show up in very different concretizations. And I'll give an example, Kilu, to the question you asked. In many senses, the Visa Corporation in its first one and a half to two decades had a number of the properties of a fair shares commons. And D. Hock, the first CEO and founder of Visa, in his book, One From Many, talks about how he wanted Visa to have many more aspects of a commons than he was 
able to build into it himself. He doesn't actually use the word commons, but if you look at the characteristics, it ticks many of the boxes of a fair shares commons. So finally, hopefully from all of this, you've seen how the fair shares commons develops business ecosystems, local ecosystems that are inherently regenerative circular stakeholder economies. It optimizes the ecosystem as a whole. And if you, what we've covered previously and also in the book, it makes psychological safety robust, anti-fragile. It really fosters and supports self-management practices and it fosters and supports developmental practices. And the bit for me that makes it really compelling and the most powerful that I have seen so far to address the problems we're facing in the world, it's the best I've been able to find or develop to simultaneously multi-solve to maximize positive outcomes across many metrics, including real ROI. So I will pause at that point and we have 20 minutes until half past the hour, whatever hour it is in your part of the world. I would love to hear more thoughts and comments and interaction. And maybe Ellie Rose, if you would again be willing to break the ice and get the ball rolling. Yeah, I'm not sure what to say really. <laughs> um, I mean, as I say, it's all kind of new to me. I've only recently in the last few months been introduced to the idea of Fair Shares Commons. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what I can add. <laughs> Well, well actually uh one of the things we just talk about in the book is that it's it's also just as critical to be a good listener and i yeah. do think you're listening well yeah i mean i've found it fascinating actually i wasn't sure what to expect coming into this session um but i've really enjoyed listening to everything that everyone has to say so, yeah excellent thank you ellie rose Could you maybe share more about, and if you said it, I apologize, this, like how um, it fosters psychological safety? Ah, I love that question. I will give you an example of fragile psychological safety. A friend of mine was working in a consultancy that was running on holacracy and also had developmental practices, all, all of these um, elements of a modern organization that are becoming more and more popular. There was a very deep level of trust between people in the organization. Monday morning, he and his colleagues walked into the consultancy to discover a completely new executive board. And the first action that they did was to rip out Holacracy and impose a standard vertical management accountability hierarchy. And they, he walked in on Monday morning to find that situation because unknown to all of the employees, the founder and owner of the company had been in negotiations with the private equity house to sell the company. And the deal was signed on Friday and a new management team was in place on the Monday. And so all of the, the perceived psychological safety was fragile. It was only there to the extent that the people who truly had the power were either enabling it or at least tolerating it and as soon as they decided to sell the psychological safety went out the window and the thing about the fair shares commons is that the staff have the same information rights as the investors so nothing can happen involving investors 
without the staff also knowing about it. Secondly, the staff have an appropriate balance of voting rights on any decision around things like selling the company. So again, if there's something that might happen that benefits one stakeholder group, but harms another stakeholder group, the stakeholder group that is harmed has sufficient voting power and information rights to truly engage in that decision properly. And finally, the one of the elements of the Fair Shares Commons company, and that's what the commons part emphasizes, it cannot be bought or sold. It's decisions need to be taken, what's in the best interests of the next seven generations. It's seen as a commons of productive capacity for the benefit of all, rather than as a thing to be sold or bought or treated as property. And it's that that really makes psychological safety as robust and even anti-fragile as possible you can get most of that. We talk about six levels of incorporation from level zero, a standard limited company, through to level five, a fair shares commons. And about in the middle is level two, a standard worker cooperative. And from level two, you start to have psychological safety that is anti-fragile. But even level two is only really anti-fragile for the staff. You don't have psychological safety for the suppliers, the customers, the investors, etc. Does that address your question, Mary Lou? Yes, thank you. Very um, articulately and and paints out a very um, full picture. So thank you for that. Can I ask on the same uh, the fostering developmental practices? How does that come out of that architecture? Ah, again, a brilliant question. <laughs> so there are two aspects to that. First of all, if a company is not Fair Shares Commons Incorporated, or at least a worker cooperative, better level three multi-stakeholder cooperative or steward owned company, then if you try to bring in developmental human practices, in other words, you bring in things like when two people are experiencing a tension between each other, that they actually go into a space of vulnerability to use that tension as information on how each of them and their relationship can develop from a human perspective very much the same as you would do in holacracy or sociocracy to use the tension to develop organizational integrity in stratum three, the, the work level, you do it at the same time at stratum one and two. Now, if you're in a traditional company where the employees have no information rights, no governance rights over the company as a whole, where the executives are Ill, voted in, held accountable by the investors of money, and where that power hierarchy cascades through the organization. And even if the organization is set up as a, in a holocratic or sociocratic way, you still have that power hierarchy hidden behind the scenes, acting like a, a gravitational field that everybody is aware of but maybe nobody talks about. As soon as you try to create a culture of high developmental vulnerability and powerful developmental practices, people who are aware and sensitive to that hidden power hierarchy are going to very quickly hold back because they, you know, they know either explicitly or intuitively that about 1% of the population is narcissistic. About 1% of the population has psychopathic or sociopathic tendencies. 
So in any organization of say 20 people or more, the probability that you have somebody in, in the, the dark triad of um, psychological tendencies like narcissism, the probability that you have somebody like that in there is high. The possibility that that person might be your boss is high. And if you have no feedback loops within that power structure, you're very exposed. Your capacity to protect yourself is severely limited. And that's why we say in Rebuild and in, in our programs in Evolute 6 around the whole methodology, it's it becomes unsafe to go beyond a certain point in developmental practices if you have anything less than a level three incorporation simply because you've got no counterbalancing feedback loops in these power hierarchies. Okay, thank you. Sounds like it is linked to the psychological safety. As well. Yes, yes. Okay. There is a lot that is linked to psychological safety. <laughs> I can keep going. No one else has questions. <laughs> it, it seems like the space is open for you to keep going, Mary Lou. Okay. Woohoo! <laughs> you're, you're, you're on a roll. <laughs> I feel psychologically safe. Let's keep going. <laughs> Ooh. Actually, okay. that, that, that's good. Oh, you might have gone back to uh, mute. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, now, um, now you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, I'm curious if um, there's any experiences or any vision towards like how to transition as like, say, a holding company with various um, uh, fair shares, commons organizations under that umbrella. Like, are there transitions where where organizations do some kind of a hybrid or um, yeah, like I can see the panacea of if everyone does this, it's all great. But yeah, so sort of in a infinite game of attracting and sort of um, creating bridges to existing different structures of organizations um, on the different levels, what that might look like. Yes, yes, excellent question. So absolutely, yes, there are multiple routes to transition. And all of those routes are part of our business plan to grow a large ecosystem of deeply connected fair shares commons companies. The, the one transition I mentioned is via the mother company investing in fair shares commons companies as daughter companies or in a corporate venture capital approach or something like that and that could work in a way where at the end of that process all of the business is being generated in this ecosystem of fair shares commons companies and the mother company is left pretty much as a hollow shell holding company and then maybe that disappears completely. So it could be something like that, you know, a, a little bit akin to the way that an amoeba um, replicates. Another route could be, and this is one that we act, have actively as part of our business plan, that at a company that gets distressed, but is otherwise fundamentally healthy that we would simply buy that company in its entirety and then we have either all of the voting rights or the bulk of the voting rights and we then just reincorporate it in one fell swoop into a fair shares commons. The same route would apply to a management buyout, a recapitalization of a company, any of the things like that where we can use the power of money to make the fair shares commons happen. And then finally, you know, the, the route that I would love to see happen, and I, 
I'm convinced that this will happen is over the next few years, we will generate so much hard numerical data proving that the fair shares commons is simply a better kind of business for investors to invest in. And then all forward thinking companies will immediately be under pressure from their investors to reincorporate because the investors get a better deal out of it, especially any company that wants to hold up ESG credentials, sustainability credentials, whatever, because then they will be under a double pressure of hard data that the Fair Shares Commons Incorporation does far better in true ESG, true sustainability, and it does better in financial returns, in particular places like pension funds who are far more interested in the value of their investments when they need to start paying out pensions than they are in the next quarterly dividend payment. So, you know, it's in that kind of situation where I can see things changing. And this is all in line with what Buckminster Fuller said. If you want to change a system, don't try to change the system. Build a new system that works better. And the old system, once it sees how much better it works, will step by step move over to the new system. Does that address your question, Mary Lou? Although, just, just let me add, though, the, you know, the, the step by step is that's never easy. There's a lot of obstacles. There's a lot of vested interests. Yes, exactly. Now, we're coming up to the end of the call. So we'll stay on longer, but just for the interests of the recording and for anybody who does need to leave about now. Um, I just want to say a couple of things on the closing slide. So for those of you who are not yet following Jack and myself on Twitter and LinkedIn, please do follow us. Um, if you've not signed up on our mailing list, please do sign up. Register for the next webinar. It's on the 31st of August and the registration should go live in the next day or two. And in the second half of the year, after the summer break, we'll be reopening our various workshops. And so if you want to really work through how do you incorporate a fair shares commons, sign up for that one. And what we're going to be putting a lot of effort into in the second half of the year is our mid-career transition program. You know, all of those people who are planning to resign from their companies in the next six to 12 months, if you know people like that, point them towards our mid-career transition program. In particular, any of those who are thinking we have to make the world a better place. We have to make businesses that are rewarding for us as individuals to work in because our mid-career transition is feeds into our startup university building startups that put all of this into practice and my big request to all of you is if you like if you like what we're doing if you think it might be useful tell your friends about the book tell them about the previous webinars they're almost all on youtube already what jack and i really want which is why the PDF, for example, we're committed that it will always be available as a free download. What we really want is to build an economy that works for all. And yes, we want to earn a decent living doing it, but our real aim is to build an economy that works for all. So we want this message to be spread as far and wide as it can be. Jack, any last words from you before we hit half past the hour actually no i think that this has been really really good i really appreciate the uh the insights of everybody uh uh you know I, i'm just um you know i just if i could just mention this is where i began but i'll just only be very very brief but 
you know, looking at the economics of fashion, I look at this as a significant obstacle. And particularly with the notion of trust, um, one of their arguments is that this is something we don't need. I mean, the market system, that is the, that's a surrogate. And, you know, that, that's a, um, it's a significant obstacle. Yes. And then it is. I really liked all of these remarks. They give us a lot of food for thought. And I really look forward to visiting with all of you again. And Hilo, I just have to ask you what you're drinking. That's a really, really large mug. <laughs> it's water. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's pretty warm here. It's not yeah. too warm, but it's just. Then I right. have to well, go and refill. Uh, it was nice to meet all you. So I have a confession. First of all, thank you for a great event. And I have a confession. I was holding back on the heart. <laughs> it's a hard. So it's a hard question for me. Maybe it's not a hard question for you, right? But but remember, I'm in this world of, you know, financing value creation, the way the current world looks at it. And it all translates down to financial value, whether it's speculatively derived or whether it's derived by building something and then selling something and then selling the company that sold something based on the potential for future growth and, you know, sort of the regular business. But it translates when we talk about creating value it translates to creating dollars. And so much of the selling of companies happens because this is how the value has been now recognized or because we recognize that there's not gonna be any more value and therefore we're gonna sell this thing while we can before it goes south and take the money out. I mean, that's the world I live in, right? And so the hard question for me is, I, I, and the, before the question, the ray of hope came when you mentioned pension funds. I hadn't thought about it, but pension fund, funds, kind of like large companies in Japan that make hundred-year-old plans, because they're, you know, they just think that way. They actually do look at creating value as this future benefit rather than value as the financial upside, ideally with the highest return in the shortest amount of time, which is, of course, the, you know, the current commercial universe with few exceptions. And how do you see a ecosystem of companies that is focused on creating real value for the seven generations, hence that cannot be sold. So that value will have to be making revenues and selling something that people want, which does sound like a good way to do business, but it's not the most profitable way to make business actually. Look at biotech companies, that's my world. Everything gets sold before they before they make a dime because it's speculative. You're cutting out a huge part of the speculative economy. And how does that compete, that narrative of creating value that way, compete with other opportunities while there are other opportunities? I can see that if there's a financial crisis that many believe might be coming, then you know, everything sort of, I don't know, slates fight clean in some ways, life doesn't stop. Then it's a lot easier, then it makes more sense. And then if you build what's needed and people want, then however it's paid for versus a speculative market of today, then it's easier. But right now I kind of don't, I don't see it believably getting the best dollars and the best attention. I get to seeing some of the idealist dollars and attention, that may be enough especially with a turn towards ESG and so on. But as long as there are quicker ways to make a buck and making a buck is what every MBA is trained it's about. I don't know how the narrative is more than ideologically attractive, but also makes the best quality dollars reach for the wallets or dollar carriers reach for the wallets in a way that the most influences the economy and the environment. Because if you have big names doing it, then okay. But is, is that a wrong question, a wrong way to look at it? Am I too stuck in my world? N not at all. And yes. <laughs> but both sides of the argument are true. Um, 
So this question has been at the heart of my design brief to myself in developing the Fair Shares Commons company. So I'll put a few thoughts in here. First of all, there's always going to be a place for short-term speculative activities. Um, the question is, where's the best place for them? You know, that's the question to address. I'll go also down another route, which is if we look at some of the most financially successful companies over the past few decades, one of my favorite examples is the Visa Corporation, which was for quite a few years incorporated in a way that is a precursor to the Fair Shares Commons. And it was one of the most valuable companies in the world. And it's really clear from D. Hock's writings that Visa would never even have succeeded if they hadn't gone down a collaborative kind of incorporation and built a company that could not be bought or sold. It was only once Visa was really successful and big that they reincorporated so that the equity became tradable. So Visa for me is a superb example of, so long as you're thinking beyond the quarters, incorporating this way is, I, there are at least case studies showing or giving examples of companies incorporate this way that are as or more successful. And the final thing I'll put in is one of the things that's at the heart of what we're doing is what we point at in section 6.4 and 6.5, that there is an assumption that is being made throughout economics and business schools and that lies very much at the heart of the approach to making money by buying and selling companies. And that's an assumption that the, let me, so without the pictures behind me, it's a bit <laughs> um, tricky to throw it up, but it's, it's an assumption that basically completely miss understands the role that fortune, good and bad, is playing in business decisions. And what this means is that much of the money that is being made by buying and selling companies is being made by selling when some good luck happens and then some bad luck kicks in later, but you never know which is going to be which, which is why so many VC funds actually don't deliver very healthy returns to their limited partners. The, the fundamental dynamics of these business processes in a purely competitive environment, in a world that is getting more and more unpredictable is more and more exposed to fortune, good and bad. And the more that fortune is playing a role in a business, the stronger that the business becomes financially, if it actually is collaborating with other businesses that are counter cyclic or exposed to systemically different fortune drivers. And this is what the Japanese Kairetsu does. This is what Procter & Gamble does. Procter & Gamble has $22 billion brands and they span a huge range of different business sectors. And if there is a trend that depresses one of the brands or two or three, 
guaranteed that same trend is going to push up the business in two or three other brands. So the total returns for an investor in P&G remain healthy, regardless of how the different um, you know, mixing dials on this disco mixing desk are moving up and down. And this is what the Fair Shares Commons brings you, is it brings you this level of interconnectivity between companies. Because they can't be bought or sold, it gives you a very high level of trust across the whole ecosystem, which really enables the kind of value share that enables the big multinationals to do what they do. And because it's a each of the companies though is a small startup where if the startup is not working well, it's really easy to shut it down. You don't have the problem of the multinationals of the management sacred cows that have to be kept alive because some senior manager likes it. Um, in this world, you have, you really have the opportunity to have this kind of very fast learning, cycling, exploration of startups coming to life and being shut down again. But everything that was created as value stays within the ecosystem. So the investors, cheers, Seth. Great to have you with us. So the investors still benefit from everything. And this is what leads to better returns at the end of the day. There's a huge amount of money in our current VC model that is simply wasted. And the center of what we're saying is, let's stop wasting money. And there is a, I agree. And there is a, there's an example that's recent as in the last five to 10 years in the life science companies, there have been these LLC models where I set up a holding company and then underneath you have these semi-independent daughter companies, many of them are funded separately and they're transacted separately. And you know, while it's made more for tax considerations than anything else, it ends up being a similar situation where, and, and actually I should take a step back. There's oftentimes a separate you know, holding unit or a separate unit of the management team that shares their management between the different companies and then they may bring in other people and you know sort of prosecute different assets as separate companies. And that has led to a better survival and better success rate to those types of companies rather than having a single company with a portfolio of multiple assets, but being viewed as a single company, it's more resilient. So I have observed that within my world. And I have, can I throw another question? I actually need to leave to for the next meeting, but it's if if okay that may be even just more a question than you know needs an answer and I'm, I'm just pondering you talked about well in my mind there is a picture being painted as i listen of the world where in the current quarterly earnings based and quarterly value creation financial value creation based system um there are some companies that are well positioned in there and there are others that inherently aren't going to be able to do things as well just because of the nature of what they're trying to do and maybe some of those companies don't even get funded or founded and if we were to be able to take that system out or create an alternative system then I'd want to ask a very simplistic question of what would be the low-hanging fruit because presumably there'd be a whole bunch of low-hanging fruits where the, the other way to ask the question is, what are the companies that are currently held back because of this quarterly nature? And if that is solved and they are able to create real value, and some of those are supported by, you know, government and defense and climate and, you know, whatever types of initiatives where they're supported anyway, but one of the reasons they're supported is precisely because the, the quarterly market type or the venture type system needs a kickstart to get them towards that level of, of maturity. It, maybe it is a mental exercise or intellectually fun exercise to try to figure out what could be the low hanging fruits. 
because asking the question that way might yield answers. So anyway, thank you. Really appreciated the the nice. opportunity as always. And, uh, Excellent. Worth making time for. Always, nice. always nice to get together. Yes. yes, it is. No, that was excellent. And Kilo, I think this could be a very fruitful discussion in one of our forthcoming sessions. So please That's hold good. the question and bring it back. Um, you know, mm -hmm. my, my immediate thought is, yeah, I can think of a few areas of low hanging fruit and it's, it's all going to be in situations. Let me give you an example of where there's still some low hanging fruit and there may have, it's a good example because it's historical rather than forward looking so we can understand this. When Elon Musk started Tesla, he actually needed to start four companies simultaneously. A computer company, an IT company building IT for transport a manufacturing company that manufactured computers that had four wheels and an electric engine, a battery company that built the batteries, and a refueling company that built refueling stations, charging stations for all of the Teslas. And he had to do all four simultaneously as one founder in one company because without all four elements, none of the elements would work. Had he been part of our startup factory, then we would have created four, maybe eight, 12, 16 different companies, maybe two or three playing in each of the four domains. And then we would have had all of the speed, the flexibility, the, the, the um, power to move fast. And we would have had lots and lots of internal competition, which would have given us more, even more in the way of innovation and speed and gain. And so I, th I think that any situation like that, where you need to build multiple parts of an entire system at once before any of the parts can take off is far better done in a fair shares commons ecosystem than in any other way that we could do it today. Interesting. I had to think about it. And that would be a good thing to think about in the life sciences as well. You know, mm -hmm. What That's, is there that yeah. is ha hard to do because you actually need to build an entirely new paradigm or system before any of it becomes profitable. Yeah, and there are good examples of life science companies where they're doing precisely that process. So I got to hop because I have to prepare for the next yes. call, but I could keep going. This is, this is a lot of fun. Wow. And Mary Laverne, so nice good to you. Uh, hope to Hope to connect. Jack, great to see you. And Thank you. Likewise, Thank you. Kilo. Always great to get together. And likewise. Thanks, Kilo. Great to see you. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye.